Radar Update. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We are watching the celestial signs and the timing of multiple prophetic events coming together right now. The Shiloh sign and even separate signs of the peace and safety warning coming together right now along with timing and patterns of the 12 months year pattern. There is so much coming together right now that we must be sober. We must set our emotions aside and just be very sober. Be very vigilant too as well. We are going to watch. We are going to take one day at a time. We do not have the full picture. We know there are things we don't know. We know we are approximately at the opposition mark right now. And we're also very close to the end of a separate prophetic sign, the warnings of peace and safety that sudden destruction is coming. We see that just a few hours after this too as well. So we know we're in a very important window right now. We see warnings of judgment very soon. And we also know the Lord is coming before judgment comes. So the fact that the opposition mark is to the best of our understanding shortly before that should be expected. All we know is we are in the approximate time when we should be expecting the end of the scepter. And in the Shiloh booklet in the back in the appendix section, definitely download it and study it. We also talk about the opposition point historically and why it was important for dividing the constellations in the appendix on section A1. So we definitely know the Chaldean Jews, Jupiter, and the scepter to define the constellations. And so we have the expectation we are at the approximate end of the scepter any day now. And so today I was doing just some more research trying to nail down exactly when is that expected transition time. And back in March 8th, that was when Jupiter was at opposition. Now, opposition is not a single moment. It's not over real quickly. It's a time. And, of course, Jupiter moves very slowly. So, on March 8th, it was at opposition all day. And for a little bit after that, too, as well. And to get a better idea, I went to JPL, which has more precise data points for the opposition. And you can see that they have the opposition. When Jupiter is shining at its brightest, when it was the most illuminated, they have it listed as the opposition and the illumination when it was shining its brightest, spread right over four days. And of course, Jupiter does move pretty slow. So notice that was on March 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, with 8th apparently being the peak according to some astronomy things. But here, they show that on all four of those days, it was at 100% illumination, basically. It was as bright as it was going to get. And this is the most accurate information you will get on it. So let's just keep this in mind as we go forward. The opposition is not a moment in time, necessarily. It is right around here somewhere. So all I can tell you is the best of our knowledge, based on the map and information we have, it is right around here somewhere. And we will continue to go forward as we get more information. All we know is it's right around here somewhere. But it's not a distinct line. And even the Babylonians kind of used the opposition mark as a rough line. They didn't have the precision instruments we do. So they would use it roughly. So again, that's why I have it fuzzy, the opposition mark. We're going to continue to watch. We have the expectation that it is reaching the mark in the end of the scepter around here somewhere. Pretty much right before the 12 month warning with peace and safety. And as we covered in our recent videos, there are multiple prophetic signs coming together right now. Not just the Shiloh sign. But we also noted that yesterday on December 7th is when Google Doodle put out their message that they know we're reaching the opposition mark to as well. They put out an early warning. And notice they put it out on the 7th, a day or two before our best understanding of the opposition mark. And it appears the opposition mark is spread over more than one day. But it definitely caught our attention that the enemy knows exactly what time it is. And they know the significance of Jupiter at opposition. And the point and how it defines the different border points. They know the significance of this prophetic time. They know the importance of these celestial movements that we understand as the shadow sign. They are viewing it a little bit differently. We'll talk about that later. But they know this celestial point we are at right now, the opposition point, is extremely important. Now, opposition is technically on that line when Earth, according to the explanation, is between the Sun and Jupiter. And so it's the closest that Earth would be to Jupiter. So that is what they showed on Google and quite a number of countries around the world. They know exactly what time it is. They know we're at a prophetic marker. And that's why they have their rising from the ashes through this time too as well. And of course, they put out the peace and safety warnings. They already know this time is very important. And they know what's coming very soon in the days ahead as well. So again, don't get wrapped up in a date. We know it's fuzzy. We know it's in this area here. The opposition's kind of spread out a little bit. So just keep your emotions in check. Be sober. Be vigilant. We will watch and keep ready. There's a lot coming together right now. And even the enemy knows that too as well. 
And we've been talking a lot about how the enemy does know this time is extremely important because they are expecting the son of perdition to come onto the scene. And this deals with their perspective of the celestial events and then also the patterning and messaging that they're putting out. They, of course, again, know the peace and safety warning. They know sudden destruction's coming. They know the timing that we've been looking at. They know sudden destruction's about to happen. They know tribulation events are about to happen, which means a son of perdition's about to be revealed. And that goes in with a lot of patterning that they've been rehearsing and commemorating for thousands of years. And we've been looking at how they set up the triumphal arch because he's going to be coming on the scene with great signs and lying wonders, and he's going to be making a triumphal entry when the son of perdition comes. But we also talked about how the organization that made the replica of the Triumphal Arch originally published that they wanted to do a replica of the Bell Bale Gate. That's what they wanted to do first. And then supposedly they backpedaled, but I think they originally meant to put out misinformation first. But then we also saw in the news a lot of attention drawn to the Bell Bale Gate too as well and the destruction of the temple but leaving the gate there. So tying the two ideas together mentally in people's minds and getting a lot of attention to it the Paul Myra Bell Gate, it's also called the Bell Gate, but then also the Roman Triumphal Gate, with, of course, triumphal and victory signs associated with palms as well. And because they're right across the street from each other, and the organization promoted both, and so we really need to consider them one and the same. When they're talking about one, they're really talking about the both, and used interchangeably. And we talked about this before with a lot of the messaging that they're doing in the placement. They are sending out a very deliberate, very systematic message pointing to the son of perdition. Going back to the time of Babel and Nimrod. And then with the sequence of their messaging, we know in the future they've been pointing to late 2016. And they still haven't released a date for that too as well. But the messaging with that pointing directly to the Nimrod Babel figure, which is at the time of the winter solstice in late December. Because that's what the events commemorate, Nimrod. How he was cut down and he will be coming back again. His pattern, his type. The original Antichrist is going to be coming onto the scene in a second version as what we know as the Antichrist. And so you have to keep that in mind. All these arch events that they've been putting up since Jupiter at opposition, which was in March, and they started putting up the arch in April, they know the significance of Jupiter at opposition because it, from their perspective, signals the return of their son of perdition, their idol shepherd that they're looking to. And that's why you see all these copies similar to the biblical patterns because the biblical patterns point to Christ. They are pointing to the anti-Christ, the opposite of Christ, the one who is against Christ. That's why you see all this dualistic messaging. The enemy, the world, the mystery of iniquity is in rebellion against God already. They've been expecting this son of perdition because they don't want God. It is a spirit of rebellion and wickedness in their heart. And they are fully expecting and desiring the son of perdition. And this is what they've been commemorating for thousands of years. And they know we're there. We're right on the threshold right now with multiple prophetic things coming together. And they know it's going to happen in the days ahead. We see that with the celestial signs and the timing as well. We've talked about the one-year delay pattern with Esther and also with Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. And we mentioned how originally our attention was drawn to the Esther pattern by the celestial signs. But then we're also warned that there is the aspect and component of judgment tied to it as well. And the same celestial signs that caught our attention then and the symmetry and the precision of it were also pointing to the commemorations that happened at the winter solstice and on December 25th, which the Bible records even those events that happened in Jeremiah chapter 10. The events that are associated with the signs in the heavens and how the heathen are dismayed at them. They're particularly referencing the winter solstice and how that ties to their sun god and everything. And that's what cutting down the tree and all that. We talked about that before. And so when the celestial signs are pointing to the time of December 25th, it's not pointing to our modern concept of Christmas or anything like that. It's pointing to a biblical pattern that the Bible records happens at that time of the year. It's pointing to a biblical pattern. And that's why it caught our attention. We know it's sound because it's pointing to a Bible pattern. Jeremiah 10 is not the only passage that warns about the commemorations connected with Nimrod. Ezekiel also talks about Tammuz and other commemorations connected to Nimrod too as well, the Queen of Heaven as well. There's multiple places in the Bible that talk about the commemorations, the ways, the customs that go with Nimrod and Babel and Babylon. And the winter solstice time is one of the biggest ones. And so when celestial events in our time are pointing directly with a context of warning to that exact same biblical pattern and that exact same biblical date, that should catch our attention. And it has. 
And we're quickly coming up onto the 12 month anniversary of that too as well in connection at the same time with the peace and safety warnings. We have multiple things warning us that the son of perdition is about to come onto the scene. And the world knows that because they are also watching the same signs too. And we looked at Daniel chapter 4 and the amazing correlations with what we're seeing now too as well with the patterning. And so why we definitely see a connection with the Babylonian commemorations and replicas that are being pulled up at this time. And particularly with the whole chapter starting, talk about Nebuchadnezzar praising God for showing his signs and wonders. And the praise of how great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. God shows us signs and great wonders to catch our attention. But he also gives us time to make changes in our life and to make ourselves ready. The signs and the wonders are shown in advance. And we should not be surprised that we are here quite a number of months later. And that fits into the Esther pattern. That fits into the Nebuchadnezzar pattern, which he was shown signs and wonders. The wise men were shown wonders too. And they saw it for over a period of several months too as well. And they did not come to the king until he was a small child. And they still saw signs right up until the end. But it also caught our attention how this chapter, which talks about signs and wonders shown for a warning in 12 months, is connected to Nebuchadnezzar with the imagery of the king of Babylon. And we looked at the imagery associated with the king of Babylon and how he was personified and how that was also the identity of Nurgle. And that's also connected to Nimrod too as well. So we're finding all these patterns in this one single chapter related to signs and wonders and 12 month warning and the patterns that we are seeing brought up to the surface by the enemy even now too as well that represent the king of Babylon and Nimrod was the king of Babylon. We have all these patterns coming into play and to guide our understanding of the times and when we do see signs and wonders. And the Lord reminded me about this passage again today. Now keep in mind that Nebuchadnezzar is the one who is dictating this chapter as a letter. Verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And you'll remember, if you're familiar with the story of Daniel, that when he was taken into captivity, that the Chaldeans gave him another name of Belteshazzar. And it's interesting to note in the book of Daniel that God always refers to Daniel as Daniel and makes historical note that they called him Belteshazzar. But this is very interesting because in this context of Daniel chapter 4, talking about signs and wonders and the one-year pattern and King Nebuchadnezzar and the pictures that he's associated with, the king himself mentions that Daniel was renamed Belteshazzar after the name of Nebuchadnezzar's God. And so when we look at just events coming together right now, Jupiter at opposition, which is when it's at its brightest. Why is the enemy so fixed on Jupiter at opposition also? Well, we already talked about before and in the Shiloh booklet about how astronomically they use Jupiter at opposition to divide up the ecliptic and the constellations there. So that was just one way they used it. And Daniel was very familiar with that as the chief astronomer there. But the name Daniel means God is my judge. And that's his Hebrew name. And that's the name used throughout the book. But Nebuchadnezzar, his name means, O God Nebu, preserve, defend my firstborn son. He is named after Nebu Nebu, who was the son of Marduk. And this is very important, the pictures that the Bible records for us. One whose name means God is my judge. And then Nebuchadnezzar, whose name invokes an idol god who happens to be the son of Marduk. Well, who in the world is Marduk? Marduk was the Babylonian chief god associated with Jupiter. So keep this in mind here when we read Daniel chapter 4. You have Daniel, whose name means God is my judge. And he's talking and giving an interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar, whose name invokes the son of their chief god, Marduk, who's associated with Jupiter. And Marduk would be the equivalent in other cultures of Zeus or something. He was their chief god. But he was associated with Jupiter. And he was also the patron god of Babylon, the city where Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel were and lived. So very important to the culture of Babylon. But Marduk, down through time, had different name changes. And by the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, he was also known as Bel or Baal. Bel is the Aramaic pronunciation of Baal. So same thing. And does the name Bel Baal ring any bells lately that you've seen in the news? Oh yes, that's what they've been pushing in all the news and getting everyone's sympathy for. The Bel Baal Gate. This is the gate that they wanted to put up. This is the one they wanted to replicate and put in Trafalgar Square in New York City and soon in Dubai. A gate about Bel Baal, who essentially is Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, who's associated with Jupiter. 
Can you start to see why they think Jupiter opposition is very important too? But then, of course, the Bible tells us that the Chaldeans named Daniel Belteshazzar, which means Bel, protect the king. And the king mentioned that he was named that according to the name of my God, King Nebuchadnezzar's God. So in this passage that talks about signs and wonders and 12-month patterns and also pictures associated with the king of Babylon, you have the connection in the chapter that the king is also connected to Baal and Baal and represents him. And he's also named after his son too as well. And then that is also connected with Jupiter. And when Marduk was shining at its brightest was very important to them as well. So you can start to see why they're using certain patterns of the bell bale gate, why they're even using the imagery of Nurgle, the winged bull, and why they're putting out the reminders that we are approaching the opposition of Jupiter threshold. All the media messaging that they've been putting out over the past few months has been because they are expecting their Marduk figure, their bell bale, which goes back to Nimrod. All that Babylonian worship goes back to Nimrod. He's the one who started him and his mother wife there. It's all commemorations of that, and this is what they're messaging. They are expecting the Nimrod figure to come onto the scene, and they know the celestial timing of when they are expecting that, when they are expecting him to make a triumphal entry. They are expecting their Bell, Bell guy. They have full expectation that he's going to be rising from destruction soon, their son of perdition, the one who originally led the world in rebellion. They have the expectation, it's a not quite true expectation, they have the expectation that he's going to be rising from the ashes very soon. And this is what they're signaling with all their messaging and the rehearsals that are going on right now in the news, and these events are still going on in the days ahead too as well. Connected with the bull of Nimrod, which goes back to Nimrod. It all goes back to Nimrod and Babel. This is what is commemorated at this time and in the days ahead. And that's why at this same event at the Colosseum, they are promoting the Bull of Nimrod and also the Temple of Baal, Bel, every roof portion of that replica. They're doing all this for a commemoration of the one they are expecting to come onto the scene. The one that they've been waiting for for thousands of years. That goes back to the rebellion that started at the Tower of Babel and Nimrod and Babylon. This is what Hollywood has been used to promote and push and keep alive those commemorations. The one who was cut down. And it all goes back to the Ishtar Gate, which was at Babylon. This is what they're mimicking. And by the way, that serpent dragon looking thing on the gate, that is a serpent dragon. That's what it represents. And that is the animal creature that represents Marduk. That's all over the Ishtar Gate. And on their stylized Ishtar Gate at Hollywood, the very seat of Hollywood, uh, they are using multiple trees. And then also consider you could go to the British Museum and they have artifacts there. How this particular king shown with depictions of the branch and the tree. Because this is what they're associated with. They're associated with the first king of Babylon who was Nimrod, who was a tree, who was cut down. And you'll see this motif used a lot. This is why a tree is used in commemoration of Nimrod. And then later kings associated themselves with the branch to show that they were a branch of Nimrod. They were a son of Nimrod, the original founder of Babylon. When the Bible talks about cutting down a tree, it is talking about very specific commemorations that the people in Ezekiel's time knew about, and Jeremiah and Daniel's time. They knew full well what he was talking about, what the tree represented, and what it commemorated. Here's a slightly different version with a palm tree branch. These are the same pictures they're using now, the Palmyra arches. Both gates are in Palmyra. And it signals the phoenix and victory and all that. I hope you are starting to see why they are using certain patterns and what the commemorations really are for. It all goes back to Nimrod, the Antichrist figure. And they know very soon, sometime apparently in late 2016, which is where we're at, that the son of perdition is going to be coming onto the scene again. The world is going to be led in rebellion again. And we mentioned how the November issue of Time Magazine, they put out a very frank warning that the end is near, which definitely caught our attention because they know what time it is. They know the celestial events going on, prophetic warnings and peace and safety and sun destruction. They know the end is near from a slightly different perspective of celestial events and everything than we as followers of Christ see it as. So they have their commemoration rising from the ashes ending in just a few days which would appear to also encapsulate a fuzzy area for defining the opposition mark. So again, don't lock yourself into a day. We don't know the exact details of when that would be defined, just that it's right around here, within just a few days, around the 9th-ish. But it caught my attention that the same day that they put out the Google Doodle, showing Jupiter at opposition, showing their god Marduk, basically, 
which is also the same day they released the next Time magazine cover, which showed their person of the year, Donald Trump. And it should catch your attention what is on the back of his chair, and they have it turned exactly so you can see what it is too and identify it. Now one thing that caught my attention with the chair is the way it was angled, and that it's very visibly not the best of chairs. It's in a little bit of a ratty condition. But when you go onto the Time website and you watch a little video of them taking these pictures, they're taking the pictures in Trump's apartment, and they actually show him reviewing the pictures too as well. And so, knowing these type of type A personalities, they're very peculiar about what's in their pictures and what they're associated with, and they like to be seen as the best. So, the fact that they are showing him in a chair that's not the best, particularly on the backside, this picture is deliberately staged and posed to catch attention and draw attention to the back of the chair, primarily the palm. So the previous issue they warned the time is near and on the same day that Google is announcing Jupiter at opposition and approaching at opposition, they put out Time magazine about the palm who they're expecting to come onto the scene. And we talked about how Trump is a pattern of the Antichrist. He isn't the Antichrist, but he's a pattern of the Antichrist. And he's a working pattern at the moment until the true Son of Perdition comes onto the scene. And we talked about he's associated with towers, even the number 666 and the symbol of Antichrist and how his deep associations with the Jesuits too as well. But they're putting out messaging of the palm that goes with the timing of all the other messaging that they put out. They know the end is near and they know we're very, very close to it. And they know the Son of Perdition is about to be revealed. And what they have been commemorating at the Winter Solstice times for thousands of years, that expectation is what they are looking at. That's why they've been looking at Jupiter. That's why they've been tracking it. That's why they know what prophetic time it is. That's why we've been able to see them line up all these patterns, a dual pattern of it with what we've been looking at over the past few months. Because they know exactly what the signs are and they are watching the signs. And they know what to watch. And it appears very strongly that it's Jupiter at opposition. The events at the time of what most people know as Christmas have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It's all about commemorating and remembering the Antichrist, the Nimrod figure, the one who started those patterns and that the Bible even talks about. And we've seen celestial warnings pointing to that time with warning. Judgment is coming. We've seen prophetic warnings of peace and safety that judgment is coming. We know judgment is coming. We know time is very short. What are we commemorating with our life now? Are we going to Hollywood to tell us how we should commemorate Jesus Christ? Is that where we're going? To learn how we should do that? Is that what we're copying? Or are we looking in God's word? To see how does he want to be remembered? How does our beloved, how does our redeemer want to be remembered? If we say we are remembering and commemorating Jesus Christ, are we doing it God's way? Are we doing it Hollywood's way? Jesus told his disciples exactly how he wanted to be remembered. And he never mentioned his birth. He told them to remember him in a very specific way and with a very specific meaning. In 1 Corinthians 11.23, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Notice that Christ told his disciples two times to emphasize, this is how I want you to remember me, and this is what I want you to do to commemorate me, to remember me. And notice down in verse 26, he says, For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show... And shows one of those good old words. It means demonstrate, act out. Not just visually show somebody something. No, you are acting it out. You are demonstrating. You are walking through a rehearsal of a picture. And he's talking about the Lord's Supper. He says, when you do this, you are commemorating, you are rehearsing, you are showing and demonstrating the Lord's death till he comes. This is what I want you to remember, disciples. I want you to remember my death, what I did for you. I want you to remember that event with those elements and what those elements represent. I want you to walk through that picture till I come. This rehearsal, this demonstration 
is for us to remember him by and what he did for us and how he paid the price for us, how he paid our atonement, how he paid our bride price. He says, I want you to remember that. I want you to rehearse it. I want you to rehearse it till I come back. And it does us good to rehearse it. The more we keep in front of us a rehearsal of what Christ has done for us, how he has redeemed us and paid our atonement, the more we will live in light of his coming. There are so many churches today that push the Lord's Supper off to just a few minutes, sometimes not even once a month. And we wonder why the churches don't have the power today, why we're not living in light of Christ's return, because we're not held in front of us the one who paid our price, who paid our ransom, what Christ has done for us. It's not rehearsed for us. It's not commemorated. It's not demonstrated. The pictures and the elements are not brought to our attention regularly. But instead they will promote, hey, let's spend a whole month promoting the pictures and the elements that Hollywood tells us to commemorate Christ by. And let's not even commemorate the event that he told us to commemorate. Let's spend all of our energy focusing on an event that Jesus even didn't tell us to commemorate. Christian, why have we gotten so far away from what God has told us to do? If our best friend, if our spouse tells us, this is how I want you to remember me by. When I go away, this is how I want you to remember me by. We show our love for our beloved by doing what he says, by remembering him, our beloved. We show our love for him by remembering him the way he wants to be remembered. Because he's coming back. It reminds us that he's coming back. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. The Bible tells us that there are two individuals who are going to be revealed prophetically very soon. The Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ, he's going to be revealed during the days of Noah and Lot, right before judgment. And right after that, the son of perdition is going to be revealed. The Bible uses the same wording for both of these events, because one's going to come right after the other, and they're going to be in very similar, amazing visual events. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are expecting the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, to be revealed any day now. We've been looking at the signs. The mystery of iniquity and Satan's disciples are expecting the son of perdition to come. Both of these individuals are coming. Which one are we commemorating in our house right now? Are we showing the one or are we showing the other? When we look in God's word and see what he wants us to use, what elements, what pictures to remember him by, and he says, do this to remember me. This is how I want you to remember me. So you can remember my death, the pictures and the related events that went with my death, how I had my triumphal entry when I presented myself as the lamb, how God provided himself a lamb. He made his triumphal entry. Which reminds us he's coming again as well. He's the king of kings. He shed his blood. He died. He rose again. And he offers eternal life to those who put their faith and trust in him. This is what he wants us to remember. In remembrance of him is why we do this. When we show, when we demonstrate, when we use those pictures and those elements, we are showing and demonstrating, I'm expecting his coming. I'm expecting the return of the good shepherd, who is the son of man, who is the righteous branch. You contrast that to what the world is getting ready for. The coming they are getting ready for. This is what they are commemorating. This is what they do in remembrance of Him. Those elements are what they use to show and to demonstrate the one who is their hero. The Nimrod figure. The idol shepherd. The son of perdition. The abominable branch. And pay very close attention. That Christ told us, I want you to do this to remember me by. And keep in mind, what is connected to why Christ wants us to remember him by? Till he comes. When we remember Jesus Christ, when we commemorate what he wants us to commemorate with him, that is with the mindset and the expectation and the anticipation that he is coming. This is the exact same reason the enemy commemorates their events with their elements, because they are expecting him to come. They know the son of perdition is going to be revealed. Two remembrances, two commemorations, two showings, two demonstrations, two acting outs, two comings. Which one are we commemorating? Which one do we want to find in our life when Christ comes? The enemy knows full well what time it is. They are looking at the celestial signs from a different perspective than we are, but they know what time it is as well with prophetic events. They know sudden destruction is coming. That is also associated with the coming of the son of perdition. All we know is we are the approximate time of the opposition mark. So we must make ourselves ready. We are just past midnight. We have heard the trumpet call that our bridegroom is just over the hill. So we must rise up. We must trim our lamps. And we must go forward and go out to meet him. 
with the expectation that he's going to be right around here very soon. Time is running out. We are on a threshold of prophetic events. We are on a threshold of the coming of the Son of Man and also the coming of the Son of Perdition. How we live shows and demonstrates who we are expecting. Christ wants us to be ready. He wants us to examine our life to see what are the secret faults in our life. What are the secret errors? What are we doing through ignorance that we might not have been aware of or just done through tradition or whatnot? But things that are highly offensive to God. We should use this time to examine our life for those faults and then also ask the Lord to strengthen us, to keep us from presumptuous sins and to give us strength to go in the direction that we should, to make the preparation that we should. We have the hope of Him coming. We should be purifying ourselves even as He is pure. We should be loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. This is the first and great commandment. We need to be examining those different courtyards of our life, the courtyard of our heart, what is in our heart, the courtyard of our soul, what is in our soul, the courtyard of our mind and the courtyard of our strength. How are we demonstrating our love for our beloved? Do we have things in our life that He finds offensive? Do we have things in our life that He takes great pleasure in? What do we have in the courtyards of our life? That shows how we love the Lord, how we love our beloved, when we do what He says, when we do what He wants to reward. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Our beloved is our Redeemer. We have heard the trumpet call at midnight. Let us rise up, let us shine bright, and let us remember our Redeemer, and let us live accordingly, shining bright and serving Jesus Christ first and highest above all else. Maranatha! <laughs>